Welcome to tonight's meeting of the Hand Eye Supply Curiosity Club. We are your hosts this evening. I am Tobias Berglinger and this is Will Lacoma. Together we have a number of curious and exciting topics to share with you. As attendees of the Hand Eye Supply Curiosity Club, you are all now members, provided you adhere to our philosophy. Ex curiositas scientia. We pledge to learn without prejudice in pursuit of our mutual goal, perpetual noviceship. We admit that it is impossible to know everything about anything, and thus we remain perpetually curious and perpetually novice. This is our flag and our mascot, Franklin. The lightning bolt represents the receipt of knowledge, the enlightenment of illumination, the resonance of truths understood. It awakens and excites us and makes us hungry for more. And now let's give a warm Curiosity Club welcome to Chana DeWolf of Cryonics Northwest. Franklin? Yeah. This reminds me very much of an XKCD cartoon called The Scientist, in which a normal person touches something that shocks them, and they go, oh no, I better not do that again. And then a scientist does the same thing, and he goes, I wonder if that'll happen if I do it again. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very uh, descriptive of the scientific mindset, I think. Um, hi, and thank you. My name is Chana DeWolf. Uh, of Cryonics Northwest and Advanced Neural Biosciences and the Institute for Evidence-Based Cryonics, um, all of which are located here um, in the area. I titled my talk tonight From Sci-Fi to Salem because my laboratory, um, Advanced Neural Biosciences, is actually located in Salem, Oregon. Uh, we are trying to move it to Portland. I would love it to be closer to, to home, but, uh, but right now that's about as as close as I can get. So I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about the history, science, and culture of cryonics. And uh, the first place to start, as usual, for all audiences, is what is cryonics, just in case you didn't do your homework before you came here for this one. Um, so cryonics is an effort to save lives by using temperatures so cold that a person beyond help by today's medicine might be preserved for decades or centuries until a future medical technology can restore that person to full health. I'll go into a lot more detail about this later. Um, first, we're kind of going to uh, look at some of the popular conceptions of cryonics and then, and then bring it full circle back to the science of cryonics um, in contemporary uh, science and medicine today. So yes, cryonics sounds like science fiction because that's basically where it was born um, as a concept, uh, but it is based on modern science, and it is an experiment in the most literal sense of the word. The question you have to ask yourself as Ralph Merkel, um, a scientist uh, formerly of Xerox, who is a very well-known cryonicist himself, um, is very much, uh, very often quoted as saying is, would you rather be in the experimental group or the control group? Because we know what, we know what happens to the control group. So here are just a few images um, of, you know, maybe the, the kind of things you think about when you hear the word cryonics or uh, my favorite, everybody always mistakenly says cryogenics, which is not exactly the same thing. Cryonics is specific to human cryopreservation. Um, so yeah, these uh, great movies like Alien and, and all sorts of uh, other fantastic Hollywood productions have given us awesome, awesome visions of what cryonics is supposed to look like. My favorite, Futurama. I really tried to get the, uh, the video um, clip to embed for Welcome to the World of Tomorrow, because it's uh, from the first episode um, where Fry uh, is unfrozen and uh, finds himself 1,000 years into the future. If you haven't watched Futurama, you're really missing something. And of course, Austin Powers, <laughs> another really silly, uh, popular movie in which cryonics is, is represented. But first I'm gonna talk really quickly. I'm gonna give a brief history of resuscitation to bring us kind of into, um, into the modern world and how we've tried to uh, uh, prevent death because that's something most of us aren't very interested in in happening to us anytime soon. Um, otherwise, you'd probably, you know, uh, do something about that if you weren't very unhappy with, with living 
currently. Most of us are on the opposite end of the scale. We want to stay alive um, as long as possible in a healthy condition, if possible. And if something does happen to befall you along the way, most likely you would like something done about that, um, like some form of resuscitation. So um, ancient methods of resuscitation have, <laughs> have included all sorts of interesting things. Uh, the application of heat, excrement, or ashes. And uh, someone has provided us with excellent illustrations of all of these methods. <laughs> I think these are coals being put on someone's uh, ab abdominal area. And flagellation, why not just beat somebody? Hey, if they're not dead, they'll wake up, right? <laughs> In fact, most of these ancient resuscitation methods really aren't so much a method of resuscitation as if you're not dead, you'll wake up because of this. <laughs> Um, more recent methods, moving into the 16th century, blowing hot air and smoke into the victim's lungs with bellows. Kind of moving in the right direction at this point. But then in the 18th century, they decided to go to the other end and uh, start instilling smoke into the rectum, which is actually where the, uh, the phrase, blowing smoke up one's ass, comes from. <laughs> it really is. And uh, whether that worked or not, um, there were, you know, there's anecdotal evidence that in some cases uh, victims were revived using this method. Um, smoke in this case, it should be noted, was tobacco smoke. So um, the effects, the stimulating effects of nicotine um, after it was absorbed in the intestinal mucosa may have been the likely uh, uh, method of action there. Not so much just the fact that you're blowing smoke up somebody's ass. <laughs> For drowning vi victims, um, uh, putting the feet above the head and, and especially uh, just, you know, hanging them upside down. That, that uh, was one attempt to get water to come out of the lungs. Uh, rolling victims over a barrel, trotting them on a horse, all very early methods uh, to attempt to, to resuscitate people from apparent death. Moving into the 19th century, we got a little more specific. Rolling victims 16 times per minute, side to back, applying pressure to the back while prone doing it backwards, but um, apparently uh, there was some, there was at least some indication that uh, this was a useful method. Stretching the tongue, I couldn't even find a picture for that one, guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think that falls into the, if you're not dead, you'll wake up category. <laughs> um, and then moving into much more modern, uh, modern times. Um, and yeah, you know, at, even up into, very, very recent history, there just was not a uniform uh, method of resuscitation that was verifiably useful and, and successful. Um, even moving into the 50s, uh, we are seeing, they're getting closer, but the only thing they can figure out uh, in order to improve circulation after the heart has stopped beating in, um, in cardiac arrest was to apply direct cardiac compression by squeezing the heart with the hand through a hole cut in the left side of the victim's chest. And the success rate of that method was still very low. Um, I think even if you got the circulation started, having a hole in your chest wasn't a very good, <laughs> wasn't a very good uh, thing for recovery. Um, and then in the 60s, we had a team of scientists uh, who discovered the benefits of closed chest compression um, in achieving a small amount of artificial cir circulation. Uh, and then, of course, later in 1960, mouth-to-mouth -mouth, um, ventilations and chest compressions were combined to create CPR as it's practiced today. And the combination of those two things uh, uh, seemed to result in a, in, in a much higher success rate. Um, these days, we're back to, there, uh, there's always changes in, if, if you've ever taken a CPR class, uh, more than once and more than a few years apart, you'll probably notice that uh, the number of compressions to breaths changes all the time based on uh, research. Um, and currently we're back to the state in which uh, almost, uh, we're recognizing that, that keeping blood pressure up by means of compression is far more important than actually ventilating a person. Um, so we're back down to no no artificial ventilations and, and all chest compressions at this point. <clears throat> but the problem here is that if, 
Resuscitation isn't possible under all sorts of conditions. What do we do then? Um, I'm assuming that, you know, if you, if you're in a situation in which uh, cardiac arrest has occurred unexpectedly or even possibly expectedly, um, and you're a lover of life and you want to live, um, you probably, if, if CPR doesn't work for you or modern medicine has failed you because of some disease, um, uh, you, you might still reach for an answer or reach for some other possible solution. So uh, there's a quote here from a cryobiologist, Brian Woke, who has been an Alcor member for a very long time. Alcor, by the way, is um, Alcor Life Extension Foundation. It's the world's uh, oldest and most renowned cryonics organization in Scottsdale, Arizona. They just celebrated their 40th anniversary um, this year with a large conference um, just last month. And Brian says, ethically, what is the correct thing to do when medicine encounters a, dif a difficult problem? Stabilize the patient until a solution can be found? Or throw people away like garbage? Centuries from now, historians may marvel at the short-sightedness and rationalizations used to sanction the unnecessary death of millions. I think that's a really important um, thing to think about when we're thinking about what the limits of technology are today versus uh, what they might not be in the future. So <clears throat> at very low temperatures, one thing that we know and that uh, cryobiologists have known for quite some time, um, beginning also in the 50s and 60s, uh, is, is that all chemical reactions in the body or in a cell um, or in a tissue sample cease. And the body can be preserved indefinitely without change for at least several hundreds of years. And why I say that is um, there are issues, minute issues like uh, background radiation from the universe that may be making uh, changes on the molecular level, um, even when a cell or a tissue or a whole organism is preserved at low temperature, but it's really, really tiny. It's, n you know, nothing, it's negligible at least for several hundred, if not thousands of years. So for our intents and purposes, we hope to make more progress. Um, uh, we have hope to make, uh, you know, significant progress during that time frame. Um, rapid scientific and technological uh, progress may offer a future solution to today's terminal illnesses. That, um, that assumes a number of uh, ideas that I'm not going to go into um, tonight, like mature man medical nanotechnology, but um, I'm sure if you've attended some of these uh, talks that you may be aware of research going on in those sorts of areas as well. And so, like I said, back full circle, then cryonics then is the use of cryogenic temperatures, very, very low temperatures, to preserve terminally ill patients with the expectation of taking advantage of those future medical treatments. Okay, that's, that's kind of the long and short of it. So in essence, cryonics is medical time travel. And one thing I do like to point out before kind of going into um, some of the scientific uh, breakthroughs that we've seen in the area over uh, over the last few decades um, is that uh, cryonics would it, it benefits everyone. It really does. Um, it's a scientific research pro project that benefits everyone because it holds possibility of preserving and banking organs, for example. Um, there's a company in California called 21st Century Medicine that does a whole lot of the research in this area. Um, Brian Woke, the uh, scientist that I quoted earlier, is, uh, is a scientist at that organization, and they get a lot of, a lot of money uh, from the FDA and all sorts of other places um, with this particular goal in mind, uh, preserving and banking organs so that transplants, which are very, very limited um, uh, in terms of the amount of time that we can currently successfully uh, it's not even preserved so much as just um, uh, extend the viability of an organ before it's transplanted. Yes? So uh, the, I, I didn't aware that I was active boy. I wasn't aware that the um, Food and Drug Administration was involved in these kind of um, projects. That's 
really interesting. So, I mean, what what category of is it is it medicine specifically, and that's what it relates to freaking organs? Yes, yeah, it's medicine specifically. Specifically, the the goal um, of preserving and banking mm-hmm. banking organs for for transplant purposes because. If you could bank an or you know have an organ bank for kidneys and um, hearts, uh, in which you didn't have to move the heart from the donor to the recipient with just a, within just a few hours, but you could just put them, you know, you could cryopreserve them for uh, several days, weeks, years, um, and they're just sitting there waiting for the, the right match. Um, we've we've made a, an enormous leap forward. Um, so that's, that's a really, really, really big goal um, of cryobiology in general at this point. Um, other other ben- beneficial aspects would be stabilization of trauma patients. Um, uh, using ultra-low uh, sub-zero temperatures, we have seen a progression towards this as well. Um, in recent history, there's been a lot of uh, research in, especially because of the wars going on, uh, uh, treatment of, of trauma patients um, and in war-torn areas and, and military personnel um, by lowering their core body temperature using chilled saline um, in order to buy a few minutes of a few minutes to you know an hour of time uh, in which they can be treated successfully. Um, and then of course allowing for human space travel that one always really appeals to the the older set. <laughs> um, to the to the uh, segment before about um, trauma patients, how mm-hmm. so would this be like a person that is like on the how how I I guess I don't understand how exactly how would you be um, serious. Okay, um, so let's just take a hypothetical situation. Your leg is blown off and you are bleeding profuse, profusely. Mm-hmm. You're basically being exsang- exsanguinated. Um, uh, lowering the core body temperature even a little bit, uh, I think the general kind of rule of thumb, it's not exact, but uh, for every 10 degrees Celsius uh, body temperature drop, you reduce cellular met- metabolism by about 50%. Um, so if you lower the temperature you know, a little bit more, you're going to um, buy time. And we, by, by what I mean by that is metabolism is reduced to the extent that it's not, your cells aren't consuming as much energy. Mm-hmm. Um, so we see this in uh, surgery, in modern mes- medicine, in um, sensitive neurosurgi- sur- neurosurgeries and uh, cardiac surgeries, um, in which complete cardiac arrest has to occur, uh, or circulatory arrest, I should say. Um, so there's no more blood flow happening um, in order to operate on either the heart or the brain. Uh, so if you uh, lower metabolism by lowering the temperature, then you can the body can withstand and the brain can withstand longer periods of ischemia, which is that's the lack of blood flow and oxygen to those tissues. So you're buying time by lowering the temperature. That's what I mean by that. Cool. That can benefit trauma patients because oh no, you're you're bleeding out right now and you're going to be dead in five minutes. Um, if we can lower your body temperature and buy you an hour to get you to the hospital, have the surgery you need to have, then we've done something great. Gotcha. But that also happens with people who get um, drowning victims. Yeah. Like bird breeders, and one of the interesting things is that normally after about four minutes of unconsciousness underwater, someone starts to get irreversible brain damage. But there have been people who have been pulled out of um, freezing water after like 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. And that seems to be even more pronounced in children, um, which is another interesting, interesting finding. Um, okay, so yeah, allowing for human space travel. Some people get really excited about that. That was never my. I was not a big sci-fi fan when I was a kid. I was more like a science reality geek, not a science, science fiction geek. Um, but lots and lots and lots of people, uh, especially in the early days of cryonics, came to cryonics because of their science fiction. Uh, fascination and specifically because of their fascination with space travel. Um, and that would be really cool, I've got to say. You, know, you could go into uh, human hibernation or suspended animation for a long period of time and uh, go somewhere really, really far away. That'd be pretty neat. 
Um, and then you know, just kind of a random thing there, preservation of endangered species. We've seen a lot of stuff uh, in scientific literature as of late, and I don't really watch television, but I hear there's all sorts of things on the Discovery Channel and uh, other, other stations of that sort about um, uh, reviving endangered species, um, and in particular, uh, woolly mammoths, because they have been so well preserved by low temperatures, are a common subject of, uh, uh, of this particular um, uh, debate. It really is a debate. Some people don't want to do it, some people do, but um, the, the, the possibility is there because these animals have been really well preserved by low temperature. And we could do that with animals that, we, um, that are endangered now as well. But most importantly, at least to me, it's kind of, you know, the overarching thing for me is that cryonics would save lives and greatly expand the human lifespan. Um, that's what it's all about uh, for the vast majority of cryonicists and specifically for people who invest a lot of their time into uh, researching and advocating cryonics. So I'm only going to touch on, because there are so many, 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 many misconceptions out there, I'm only going to touch on some of the really major ones. And the first and foremost one is, but doesn't freezing cause damage? I hear all these really great scientists that are really well, well known telling me that cryonics is total crap, because uh, if you take a strawberry out of the freezer, it's all, it's all turned to mush because of all the ice crystals that, uh, that formed. And, and and uh, they exploded the cells, or something like that, which is um, not true. But uh, but but yes, freezing does cause damage. It doesn't explode cells. Um, it actually causes ice crystal formation outside of cells, which pulverizes the cells in between the ice crystals. Not any better, really. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't matter if you get that wrong. Freezing really is uh, it really is bad. Um, for, for cells and for organized tissues. Um, so it's really important to point out here that cryonics is not about freezing people. Um, it has long been cryonics practice to perfuse, which just means to circulate a cryoprotective agent through the body before lowering it to cryogenic temperatures. Now a cryoprotective agent is basically just a uh, biological antifreeze. Um, and we say biological antifreeze because it's generally in some sort of physiological carrier solution, but it really is, it really is composed of uh, essentially the exact same sort of antifreeze components that you would find in, in regular uh, mechanical, uh, like car antifreeze, um, ethylene glycol and BMSO and great chemicals like that. Um, but, uh, you know, if you circulate that and perfuse all the tissues uh, with this, uh, with these cryoprotective agents, Essentially, you're going to replace a large portion of the water in the cells with these cryoprotective agents. And when you lower the tissue or organism to cryogenic temperatures, it doesn't freeze. It doesn't freeze at all. Um, and no ice crystals are formed. Now, that's only if the tissue is adequately perfused, which is the goal. <laughs> um, how, how is that applicated in the um, it, through the circulatory system. So it requires circulatory access, um, just the same way as a uh, cardiopulmonary bypass would be performed. Um, so surgical access to the circulatory system, generally through a femoral vessel um, or a carotid, the carotid arteries. Um, and then uh, a, a, a washout to wash the blood out is performed first. Um, and then the cryoprotective agents are circulated throughout the body or the head, if you're, there are neuro-only um, patients as well, uh, and that's that's kind of the, the general the general aspect of it. And then the the antifreeze itself, is it does that cause any damage to the the body? That's a good question, and uh, that is a whole other topic as well. Um, if it is administered, if it's circulated through the body at higher temperatures, there are known uh, toxic effects of the cryoprotective agents on cells, uh, which is one of the reasons that a lower concentration is introduced um, first. Um, and as the temperature of the patient is 
lowered, higher concentrations of, of the uh, cryoprotectants are perfused in. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of touch on that just a little bit later. So, <coughs> so no freezing. Freezing is bad. That's true. It really is. It's really awful, and that's something that almost all cryonics research, well, pretty much all cryonics research is hell-bent on avoiding. No freezing. You do not want to be a straight freeze case. Um, there are situations in which um, it's impossible to uh, cryoprotect a patient. Um, a, a member uh, who may have cryonics arrangements, uh, people, people um, die under the most oddball circumstances, really. Um, generally not always an ideal case. <laughs> um, it, you can be an ideal case. You could, you could be terminal for some time. You could move to Arizona, uh, close to your cryonics organization. Um, there is another cryonics organization in the U.S., in Michigan as well. Um, uh, uh, you, could, you could be really close to, to maximize your, your you know, po uh, possibility of a, a good cryo protection, um, but sometimes it doesn't go all that well, and you may be lying on your floor for three days before someone finds you, um, in which case, uh, frequently, the protocol will be to forego the cryo protection altogether because you may not even be able to access the circulatory system under that, that situation. Um, and a lot of the research that's been done, including in my lab, um, has shown that uh, there's not adequate perfusion of cryoprotectants into the brain or any tissue, honestly, at that point. You get real severe perfusion impairment um, after many, many hours of ischemia. And uh, you may be getting to this, but how about um, removing the um, perfusion after, and when you're reviving someone that's, is it the same way that it goes in or is it, I mean, is it like a transfusion? Get there in just a second. Okay. <laughs> we don't do any of that yet, but, um, but we, not with whole patients anyway, but I will talk about some of the kidney work that's been done at 21st Century Medicine. Um, so if freezing causes damage, then how would we be able to revive a more mammoth, for example? Well, we're not reviving the actual mana. The DNA. Oh, using the DNA. Yeah, when we're talking about that kind of that kind of preservation, they're talking about um, using the DNA to make a clone, and uh, DNA is a, a lot smaller than or you know um, cells. Uh, so there's a lot of DNA that's still preserved under those conditions. It's not damaged by ice crystals. Okay, so what happens when you replace uh, when you replace a, a, a vast majority, um, sixty percent or more of the water in tish, cells or tissues with cryoprotective agent, and then lower the temperature really significantly below the glass transition temperature, um, is something called vitrification. You may have heard this if you have had any involvement in glass, um, uh, or you know anything about glass. Uh, essentially, um, uh, when you lower that tissue that has so much cryoprotective protective agent in it um, past a temperature known as a glass transition temperature, um, it essentially becomes a glass-like solid. There are no ice crystals, um, but it is a very glass-like solid uh, capable of uh, basically perfect preservation, which we'll, we'll look at here in just a second as well. So, uh, in fact, cryonics has greatly benefited already from current scientific progress in the form of vitrification. That was before this technology was introduced. Um, there were other uh, cryoprotective agents. We were using more primitive cryoprotective agents like glycerol um, uh, that weren't capable of full vitrification below the glass transition temperature. There was still freezing happening in certain pockets of tissues and things like that. Um, so that cryopreservation technology allows for tissues to be lowered to cryogenic temperatures without freezing. Um, and then reversible vitrification with good viability has been demonstrated in the kidney and structural preservation of the brain is nearly perfect. So we'll look a little bit of that. Here's a frozen kidney. From, this is a, an image from 21st century medicine. They um, are the leaders in uh, cryobiology cryo in general. Um, 
and uh, vitrification technology in particular. Alcor licenses, uh, they license a number of uh, vitrification solutions um, to Alcor for human cryopreservation cases. They're the guys, like I said, who are also doing a lot of this mainstream research into organ banking, um, et cetera. So they picked kind of one of the hardest uh, organs in the body to successfully um, cryopreserve uh, and then reverse the cryopreservation and re-implant back into the animal in order to see if it functions. The kidney. The kidney is actually extremely complex. It's very similar to the brain in a lot of ways in that it has uh, cellular organization um, including a cortex just like the brain does and um, uh, and, and a subcortex and the medulla, things like that. So there's a lot of different things going on in the kidney that, um, and tons of different types of cells to support all of those different functions that all have to be successfully um, well preserved and then uh, reverse the cryopreservation, re implant the kidney. In this case, it's a, a, in a rabbit. Um, in, in order for it to function and for us to evaluate whether this vitrification was successful. And that's exactly what they've done. So, um, again, you can, you can really see the difference between something that has been frozen versus something that has been vitrified. It looks, there's no ice crystal formation in that vitrified kidney whatsoever. It looks beautifully just like a fresh kidney. Um, it's stuck in all of this uh, solid cryoprotective agent surrounding it at this moment. But if you were to remove it from that in its vitrified state, it's very difficult just visually to even tell the difference between a fresh kidney and a vitrified kidney. It's really amazing. When did they get that result? Ooh. I'd say, don't quote me on it, but around 2006 or so, maybe, maybe a little earlier than that. Um, and, and, and what they did in this particular case was they removed a kidney from a rabbit. They vitrified it. They, you know, perfused all of these cryoprotective agents in, um, lowered the temperature while they were increasing the concentration. They, once they reached uh, what we call CNV, concentration necessary to vitrify, uh, they lowered the temperature all the way to the glass trans transitions temp transition temperature, which is about minus 130 degrees Celsius. Went a little bit lower than that, just so they could say, be safe in staying below the glass transition temperature. And they held it there for a few days. Doesn't matter at that point. A few minutes, same as a few years. If there's nothing going on at the molecular level. But, you know, might as well hold it there for a few days or a week, just to prove the point. But then they got impatient because they wanted to know the results. And uh, they rewarmed and removed the cryoprotectant during rewarming through the same process, yeah, they have to recannulate the vessels and, uh, and wash out um, the cryoprotectant with another solution. Um, typically, they'll just and ramp that, it back like, down. that's window temperature? Like yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it's very precise, uh, very precise uh, ramping protocol. Um, uh, and once they had successfully both uh, removed the cryoprotective agent and rewarmed the kidney, they re-implanted it back into the rabbit, and then they removed the contralateral kidney. They took it out so that it had to function with just this previously vitrified kidney. And it was successful. It was really a huge leap forward um, in cryo, you know, cryopreservation technology. Um, so that was, I think actually I'm, I'm wrong, that was 2001, I think, I'm pretty sure. That was an enormous, enormous technological breakthrough. Um, in cryobiology in general. Uh, and then in terms of brain tissue preservation, um, sort of historically, again, uh, if you're a cryonics patient before 1992, um, you would probably receive, you know, we knew cryoprotectants worked, but there, the, this, this vitrification technology had not um, been introduced yet. So uh, the best we could go on was, was uh, what cryobiology was using for the preservation of, of cells, embryos, and small, small tissue samples, which was a glycerol. Um, 
So here we see brain tissue. That's a lot of ice crystal formation um, and a lot of fre freezing damage, you know, uh, associated with that. After treatment with three molar glycerol, um, and this shows really extensive, again, ice crystal damage, and this is the kind of damage that many com commenters assume is common in cryonics patients, um, but their assumption is very outdated and incorrect. Um, between 1992 and 2001, uh, they started using higher concentrations of glycerol, They're starting to figure out that if you replace more water with more cryoprotective agent, uh, you prevent more freezing. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's really good for the cells, uh, putting more cryoprotectant in, but um, you know that freezing is really bad for them, so uh, that was kind of the goal here. And uh, this electron micrograph can't see too well, uh, but it, hmm, there's a capillary here that's not showing up very well, and there's like a big, a big tear next to it. And these are all uh, very common examples of, uh, of the kind of damage that occurs um, uh, when, when ice crystals form, when there's freezing damage. Yeah just tears things up, literally just tears holes in tissues. Um, but otherwise, there's pretty decent structural preservation. It doesn't look like that. You know, what is that? That's just ice crystals. Um, you can still tell kind of what's going on in this, in this scenario. There's a few tears here and, uh, and, and all of that, but, um, but you can actually still infer uh, what the tissue looked like before. So ice damage is occurring at intervals throughout the brain. Um, but most of the volume of the, the brain is remaining ice-free. And then today, with vitrification, um, this is brain tissue preserved with modern vitrification solution showing uh, almost no freezing damage at all. There's none observable. Again, it doesn't show up ex especially well on this uh, projection screen, but um, there's virtually uh, no observable uh, freezing damage in this tissue sample. Um, whole neurons are visible with intact membranes and, and cell structures. Uh, this is the excellent brain preservation which Alcor can now achieve in human patients. Um, and most experts who complain about damage caused by cryonics procedures are unaware that, that such preservation is possible. Because they haven't even bothered to update their knowledge since they first heard about cryonics in 1970. And even more excitingly, this is uh, my background's in electrophysiology and neurophysiology, so this is really right up my alley. Um, brain slices have been shown to resume activity after vitrification. Um, in May 2007, 21CM again, uh, researchers announced a demonstration of a well-studied type of electrical activity in the brain known as LTP, it's commonly referred to as the memory mechanism, um, in vitrified and rewarmed brain slices. Um, so that's really cool. It's not just spontaneous activity that uh, we're seeing. Um, it's, it's coordinated electrical activity. Um, in particular, LTP is kind of a, they call it the memory mechanism because it's, it's basically, um, you can uh, train a neuron to respond a certain way to a stimulus and it remembers how to respond to that same stimulus later. Um, and we're seeing the maintenance of LTP, which was induced before the slice was vitrified, after it's rewarmed from vitrification. So that is really, really strong evidence of the maintenance of not only the ultra structure, which we can see in the electron micrographs of neural tissue, but also the function and even possibly the preservation of memory and personality, or at least the, uh, the things that are necessary for um, and most neurophysiologists believe that the same mechanisms underlying the maintenance of LTP are also important in the creation and maintenance of memory. So that's super duper exciting. The next step, before I move on to the next slide, the next le step would be um, uh, after showing that we can maintain electrical, you know, uh, coordinated electrical activity in a brain slice, would be to show that um, a whole brain um, exhibits spontaneous and coordinated electrical activity after vitrification and rewarming. And that is specifically what my company is working on right now. That's arguably the most ambitious uh, cryonics goal to date. So 
what does it all mean? Um, taking together the findings of excellent structural preservation and demonstration of coordinated electrical activity in the brain mean that under ideal circumstances, uh, current cryonics procedures preserve viability of the brain, making future possible resuscitation a plausible possibility. Of course, it would be unethical to resuscitate cryonics patients, even if it were possible now, given that they all suffer from a variety of diseases for which there are currently no cures. So great, it doesn't matter if we can reverse, a, you know, reverse uh, cryopreserved patients or, or their brains. Um, well, I guess if you're an uploader, you'd be satisfied with, <laughs> with reversing uh, cryopreserved brains. Um, but if you want to come back, uh, you know, basically the same as you are now, um, just resuscitated, um, then uh, you've got something else that needs to be cured first, whatever kills you in the first place, whether that be aging or some sort of disease. Um, but, you know, and that's, that's something that other researchers are working on. We know about all the millions and billions of dollars spent in disease, uh, in research for curing all sorts of diseases, all diseases. Um, and now aging research is getting, uh, and rejuvenation research is getting, um, um, much more popular in the scientific mainstream, um, and much better funded, uh, recently as well. And those things all go hand in hand with cryonics, because cryonics provides these patients the means to reach a time when those uh, cures are likely to become available. So, the fun part of the talk. <laughs> uh, why is cryonics so unpopular? I spent a lot of time thinking about this. My husband, um, with whom I work, and, and whom I met at a cryonics conference in 2006, um, he works full-time in the field of cryonics. He writes a cryonics blog, among other kinds of blogs, and we try not to talk about cryonics constantly because that would get really boring, but, um, but we do talk about this topic quite a bit because after 40 years, um, there are still fewer than 2,000 cryonics members in the world. And actually, I'm really excited to say that number. 2,000, wow. <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole lot. Are those people who are No, so patients, in terms of, and we, we do refer to them as patients because we do really want, we, cryonics, and I'll, I'll get there in a second because that's where I'm leading with this. Um, um, cryonics has suffered from a number of, of issues historically, and one of them is uh, the way people have used words like, Freezing. There are still older cryonicists who, who refer to freezing people. And that doesn't help us because we're trying really hard to, to do what I'm doing right now, to educate people that we're not freezing people, you know, we're, we're vitrifying um, and trying to prevent freezing damage. Um, but uh, uh, to answer your question, there are, I think, uh, about no, 200 patients at Alcor, and maybe around the same amount or less at Cryonics Institute. Those are the two major cryonics organizations in the U.S. Um, CryoRus, which is a Russian cryonics organization that um, came around about three or four years ago, they have 12 or 15 patients. And now there's an Australian cryonics organization that's just getting off the ground as well. So yeah, very few people have been cryopreserved. So yes. What's the approximate budgetary cost? Or what's the budgetary pricing for cryonics? It really, really depends on where you go. <laughs> it's one of the biggest differences between um, Alcor and Cryonics Institute. Okay, so what, what would be a budgetary number? Just I was Alcor, eighty thousand um, dollars neuropreservation. That's head 80, only. Eighty thousand. Yes. Head, mm -hmm. head only. Okay. And I believe the minimum for whole body preservation just went up to 180,000 or thereabouts. Okay. So mm -hmm. under a quarter million dollars. Is there like there are events? Funded through life insurance, by the way. Another myth debunked. It's not just for wealthy people. Oh. I have life insurance and it funds my it'll fund my future cryopreservation. Yep. Uh, <laughs> is that spread 160 if that's just the cool. procedure? Is there like future rent? Uh, absolutely. A, a large portion of that goes into a patient care trust fund, um, which is made, 
maintained separately for future resuscitation uh, needs. Of, well, for long-term maintenance, which there isn't a whole lot that goes into it. Liquid nitrogen is cheap, doesn't require power, um, just requires topping off the doers all the time. Um, and it boils off if you have really efficient doers, which, um, which both cryonics organizations are constantly trying to improve their doer technology to reduce boil off rates. Um, the boil off is really minimal and uh, they'll maintain a bulk tank in the corner, just have it refilled every few months and top off their tanks automatically when they reach a certain level. Um, and the cost of level one two is really, really low. Uh, so long term maintenance and then um, uh, yeah, future uh, resuscitation costs as well as reintegration and re rehabilitation which there's so much uncovered ground there. <laughs> and the doer, that's the container. <laughs> yes, yeah, I don't have crazy. Everybody with a cryonics presentation puts a Bigfoot doer, the Alcor model, in the slides, and I should have. You can find one um, online really easily. It's Alcor, um, the, I, the, the costs I quoted you were for Alcor because I'm an Alcor member. Okay. Um, cryonics Institute is significantly lower priced, I believe. They only offer neuropreservation, um, but without neuro separation. So they don't separate the head from the body. They just uh, focus the cryoprotective uh, perfusion on the brain. Um, but they do keep the head connected with the body um, and you're cryopreserved as a whole body in the doer. But I think their costs are around $30,000. Wow, that's much cheaper than I would have thought. That reflects a couple of different things. Um, Alcor offers what they call standby and stabilization as well, which is literally a team of people who, if you know you are agonal and going to die, will come stand by your bedside and wait for legal death to be pronounced so that they can uh, take over as soon as possible after your deanimation. That really, really increases your chances of a much, much better uh, perfusion and cryopreservation. Um, because you're not suffering all of that dam ischemic damage due to the lack of blood flow and oxygen to your tissues at a high temperature. So they'll just be right there, and as soon as you're pronounced, they start cooling. Um, they administer medications to support uh, blood pressure, um, uh, neuroprotectants to also uh, help mitigate uh, damage due to ischemia, um, volume, uh, volume expanders to help keep your blood pressure up as well. Um, and chest compressions to, basically the, the whole goal of stabilization is to keep all your, your tissues viable and your brain in particular viable um, in route to uh, a surgical, either a mobile surgical suite or the operating room at Alcor um, prior to your cryopreservation. You wanna be as, your brain needs to be as viable as possible. Is it already legal in Ireland around like doctor assisted um, suicide? Like at all? Can I get back to that one? Can I get back to that one? Yeah. <laughs> Why is Karen so unpopular? <clears throat> a few different explanations. Um, Saul Kent, who is a long time cryonicist and a very successful businessman who funds a lot, funds a lot of cryonics efforts. Um, uh, to this day, uh, wrote back in 1999 an essay called The Failure of the Cryonics Movement, very, very uh, sensational title. And he argued that um, uh, one of the biggest hangups is that nobody thinks it'll work. Um, honestly, if that were the case, the technological breakthroughs um, that have happened over you know, the past couple of decades in particular with vitrification, uh, these breakthroughs should strengthen the case that cryonics will work and you should see more and more people uh, signing up because of that. And that hasn't been the case. I mean, the, the statement that millions of people will view that cannot be falsified, but the view that cryonics will work also cannot be falsified. Eventually without, it can be. I mean, <laughs> right, without like actually you know, waking a rat up. Well, yes and no. We can falsify it through increasing uh, incremental steps towards um, success. So some of the things that I outlined today, um, a good ultrastructural preservation, um, maintenance of spontaneous and coordinated electrical activity, um, all, all of those things are bringing us closer and closer 
to, to, to proving that cryonics can work. We're not there yet. Nobody said, nobody said cryonics works or will work. But we're incrementally moving our way towards being able to say that. Um, there's tons and tons of other uh, views that you can't even incrementally make your way towards, <laughs> towards saying that they're, they're right or even anywhere near uh, possible. Um, so for these kind of, you know, a couple reasons like this, I really don't think that, um, that that's a, a really good argument about why cryonics is so unpopular. Yeah, there are plenty of people who think it's crazy and it will never work, but there are plenty of people who do and they still won't do it. Um, another argument might be cryonics organizations don't do a very good job of explaining the technical feasibility of cryonics. And where that might be true to an extent, although if you've ever visited Alcor's website, I think they do a fantastic job. Um, uh, I would say that if making cryonics arrangements is appealing, there would be no shortage of other people repackaging that message um, and relaying it to others. And we don't see that, except for me. <laughs> you know, and a couple other people, but you don't you don't see people going around in droves uh, trying to find different ways to, to talk about cryonics to others. People don't want to reflect on their own mortality. Hmm, there's probably a bit of truth to that one. Um, especially for younger people, uh, we definitely see a lot more last minute cases um, or people who are very old and finally have started thinking about their mortality and the fact that they don't want to die um, or they want to continue living and, and the possibility of future medicine might give them rejuvenation at some point and uh, they're looking for a way to reach that. But um, uh, yeah, that's, it's, it's something that doesn't really happen a lot bef before you, people get to that point. Um, so I think there is a little bit of truth to that. Um, and a solution to that, though, um, is to prevent cryonics as a form of long-term critical care medicine, kind of circumventing the whole, the whole death part, not as the science of freezing dead people. Uh, and that, in particular, I think, would uh, be helpful because it would stress the fact that human cryopreservation is a logical extension of conventional medicine, which I think is hugely important, and that cryonics has not done well at all, historically but they're trying very hard to now. <laughs> um, and it minimizes uh, religious ob objections. You get a lot of religious objections to cryonics that don't make any sense. Are you <coughs> religiously objecting to um, CPR or cardiopulmonary bypass? No. Um, but uh, people will re you know, reject cryonics on religious grounds because they see it as raising the dead or you're trying to be immortal um, or you're playing God. Um, and if we present it more as just form of critical care medicine, we can circumvent those kinds of arguments a little better. And now we're getting even more down to what I think is the issue, which is cryonics implies a potential loss of everything that gives meaning to our existing lives. And um, uh, I kind of just have a, a note down here, an important condition for most people to accept cryonics is that they will be restored to good health with everything they know and care for. Um, but such a scenario is most likely to occur if a substantial number of people already have made cryonics arrangements and created an infrastructure to minimize loss and alienation. And that's really hard to do when you start out marginalized. But I kind of think this is basically kind of the end of everything. Um, and that we're starting to see a change there. But I want to talk really briefly <laughs> about historically what the differences are. So. Historical cryonesis demographics. Anybody want to guess? Old people. Old women. Like <laughs> Not so much old, but Rich. single male computer scientists. <laughs> 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 people who are very rational, very interested in uh, information preservation and view their, their brains and, and, uh, and personalities and everything associated with that as just, um, as just a, a computer that needs to be preserved in some fashion um, and brought back to crunch data at a later date. Um, <laughs> a whole lot of early cryonicists fit this, this profile. Um, 
And, it, you know, that's really cool. Somebody has to start it. But these guys didn't do so well in the dating pool, and uh, they didn't bring, you know, like religions often grow by reproducing, people reproducing and bringing their children into into the fold, and uh, Kranix hasn't had any of that <laughs> historically. Um, on top of that, these guys, even when they did get married, um, frequently faced um, other issues, uh, which I'll get to in just a minute, in terms of trying to bring their partners into cryonics. However, I will say, um, this is really changing. This has really changed a lot. Just over the last 10 or 15 years, we see whole families signing up. And honestly, I think that really has to do with, with um, some of the other things I talked about earlier, changing the way we're presenting uh, cryonics uh, to people in general. There were a number of controversial cases in the history of cryonics as well, and uh, at least one very unfortunate incident. Um, you, some of these you may not have ever heard of, but uh, the Dora Kent case, Ted Williams, the famous baseball player, lots of media surrounding that one, huge family, uh, fam you know, family arguments, family disputes going on surrounding um, whether or not someone wishes to be cryopreserved in this case, in Ted Williams' case, that was, that was the controversy. Um, and generally, that's not a question because there's tons of paperwork involved in, in making cryonics arrangements. And we very, very much encourage people to um, to make their wishes known to their friends, you know, at least immediate friends and family members, to kind of avoid those situations. Um, but especially where uh, life insurance, which does fund cryonics, is involved, people get kind of crazy over the fact that your money is going to some, you know, supposedly crackpot idea um, instead of to me. And people will get really nervous and fight over that, and they will do crazy things, um, including trying to prevent your 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 cryopreservation wishes altogether. And uh, the Chatsworth incident, which I believe there's actually a movie being made of. Um, this was featured on This American Life, I think, on NPR not too long ago. Really, really unfortunate. Um, early, very early '70s early cryonics uh, company that did not maintain their patients and all thawed. Uh, it was really horrible, 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 horrible situation. How many, how many people thawed? Oh man, I'd have to look that up. Um, I mean, it wasn't like, it was really early, right? Yeah, and, and it was probably like 10, 15 people, but um, but yeah, this, this really leaves a bad taste in me. I think we're frozen in the pre-92 approach, right? Yes. Yeah, they were, they were crop reserved first, but they weren't maintained. Um, the, the, the organization in question did not really take care of their patients at all. Um, they collected the money. With, the, um, with patients that were frozen that early and before they uh, had perfected the vitrification process, are there sort of, do people talk about sort of ethical concerns with bringing people back that have may have experienced like severe brain damage or any, or organ damage of any sort? Absolutely, yeah. Um, there is a general kind of uh, uh, consensus that as cryopreservation technologies improve, your chances of being resuscitated are, are greater. Um, that may or may not be true. I mean, we don't know what the, what the capabilities of uh, mature nanotechnology will be in terms of repairing that kind of damage. And ultimately, it comes down to what you can infer from what was preserved. Um, and we just don't know. We, we literally, we just don't know what the answer to that is at this point. But um, some people would say it doesn't pay to be a pioneer in cryonics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so one thing that's always that I thought about was, and, it, and it's partly uh, it has to do with, like, I guess it was the Chatsworth incident, but the financial security of the company that's in charge of keeping these patients in the state they're supposed to be or that they paid for, and things like maybe, oh, is this company on the stock market? Could it fluctuate? Could there be, you know, all, all sorts of variables? Right. That, that's one thing. You really hit the nail on the head because a large part of what happened with 
Chatsworth incident was this company set up and um, they decided it would be a really good idea to have um, family members continue to make uh, payments towards uh, the patient's maintenance. Well, you don't have to get very far down the line or even very far forward in time before somebody's like, I want that $180 a month, you know? <laughs> it just doesn't make any, it's just not smart. Uh, I wouldn't say it doesn't make any sense, but it's not a smart move. And that is exactly how that went downhill really fast. Yeah. Um, Alcor um, set up the patient care trust that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and with that very thing in mind, um, it's set up as its own company, separate from Alcor itself. So even if Alcor goes under and they can't ever cryopreserve another patient, um, the money exists in that in that trust to take care of the patients who are already there in perpetuity. So I think that was there's always all, there's so much to consider in actually a, especially a long-standing successful cryonics operation, um, and it gets really complicated really fast. But yeah, you can pretty much learn from the real duh cases pretty fast. Right. I could go in just a moment, but I'd like to ask one more monetary question, sure. not a question. Uh, there's research, you're doing research, obviously your mm -hmm. lab and, and many others. You said you mentioned that some funding is coming from the FDA. Do you have a, a just a ballpark? Not my lab. <laughs> oh, I'm just curious, where did the funding for the research is coming from? Is it private? Is it uh, being funded? Uh, where is the, I used to work for scientists, so this is a question I always ask. Cryonic specific research is very hard to get funding for. Um, our mm -hmm. lab is a cryonics research organization. Um, our uh, research funding has come from uh, both cryonics organizations in the United States for specific research that they want done, as well as um, organizations associated with them. Um, in particular, uh, Cryonics Institute has a, uh, a nonprofit, an associated nonprofit organization called the Immortalist Society um, that, for one thing, prints their the Cranics Institute magazine, and for another, uh, funds research when and where it can. It's really well, small. Foundation that's taking care of the contributions. Right, and then yeah. more recently, we have gotten some directed grants from Life Extension Foundation, uh, which is a large vitamin company in Florida, owned wow. by two very wealthy cryonicists. So that Saul Kent, the guy I mentioned earlier who wrote The Failure of Cryonics Movement, um, is one of the owners of that company. He funds, they fund, I should say, a lot. Like so a lot, a lot of cryonics. From, from commercial ventures who are, are selling the service and from charitable contributions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's virtually no public funding yet. Not yet. There will be, obviously, when, the, when people Unless think the idea is viable. But it's it's a huge. It does, like a huge, huge, huge huge politics and science funding. Yes. So, I don't know if I know this on the paper, but is it Thank necessary you. to die before you're preserved? So, you... It just seems to be... Dude, it would be, it it would be, be helpful awesome if you didn't, if you but yes. I have this terminally, terminal disease, mm -hmm. right? So, yes, you do have to be pronounced legally dead. Um, an or a cryonics organization... Is that illegal? Or is that, you know... You have to be pronounced legally dead um, based on uh, cardiorespiratory or cardio, uh, or brain death. That cannot be Please don't do... You really hope that you don't, they don't use brain death as a criterion because that can sure. go a lot longer than, than your heart stopping. Right. Um, so, uh, and that is, that's, that's a legal consideration because uh, theoretically cryonics organizations have something to gain from your, from your death, right? So they cannot be seen as have hastening that process in any way, shape, or form. Um, uh, but yeah, <laughs> if you have a terminal disease and uh, say a brain tumor, especially a personality destroying uh, neurodegenerative disease, in which the longer you have this disease, the more of your brain is getting, is just, you know, being destroyed. Uh, it would be very beneficial to the patient if they could be euthanized by cryopreservation. Absolutely. So that is possible, though. Just not legal. Correct. Okay. 
Yeah, pets, pets get better cryopreservations in that sense because we can do that with them. Mm -hmm. You don't have to wait. You know, you can, you, Fluffy is, has got terminal cancer and you can take them to your cryonics organization, circumvent all that horrible suffering and euthanize them by cryopreservation and they receive an excellent, excellent preservation as a result. That's what I mentioned. Is it, would that be possible to do an organ though if you set up a So we don't know. That, um, we just had a symposium in July, um, just down the street from here, on called Cryonics and uh, Brain Threatening Disorders, where we talked a lot about that. Um, there's a reason, my husband, many reasons my husband and I moved here, but that's one of them. Um, ultimately, we don't know because nobody's done it. Um, uh, but, so the, the Oregon laws are if you have a terminal uh, diagnosis by two doc doctors, um, they can prescribe you a, bar a lethal dose of barbiturate for you to take at your choosing. Um, and yeah, that would be fantastic if you're a cryonicist and you did find yourself in that situation because you would know the time of, the time of your death. It could be, you could have people standing by a doctor to pronounce you immediately and your standby and stabilization team right there. There is nothing saying that that isn't a possibility here, but um, uh, there's there's nobody who's done it so far. So um, we'll see when the time comes. Um, some people really kind of want to lobby for making that happen, but I think that draws too much attention um, to the situation in a negative way first. And I'd much rather see somebody who actually just finds himself in that situation and who can take advantage of the law, just do it, and then see see what happens. I have a feeling if you can do it all the right way, there's not gonna, nobody's even going to raise their eyebrows. You know? Last but not least, uh, two things. Um, a tendency to link cryonics with other isms, atheism, transhumanism, uh, singularitarianism, I've never heard that one before. Um, lots and lots of isms. We find that people in these other uh, subcultures and, and movements identify with cryonics, and that's great, but then they try to force the two things to be one and the same somehow. Um, and I don't think that does cryonics any favors either because it really alienates people who don't participate in those things. Um, and in particular, it alienates um, people of faith, which is totally unnecessary. And then it all brings us back down though to these psychological and psychosocial barriers. Um, fear of the future or waking up alone and uh, fear of derision from social groups, which then has been hypothesized mm -hmm. to be uh, one of the reasons why um, there are so few women involved in cryonics and why uh, so few female partners of male cryonicists um, want to uh, sign up and frequently will also try to uh, keep their partners from being involved in cryonics. Because what will the neighbors think? Oh no. Um, I think these are really uh, the, the, the big kickers. Um, in particular, like if, you're, if you have a heart attack and fall on the ground and somebody is there to, who could successfully resuscitate you within a few minutes, you'd be, of course, you're gonna say yes, right? But when you start extending that, that window, <laughs> resuscitation window further and further and further out, at some point for a lot of people, their answer changes because they don't, know what their life is going to be like in that future. Um, if it's five minutes from now, you know, you're going to, your, your wife, your kids, everybody's still going to be there, your job, what, whatever. Um, a year from now, different story, five years, even more different, and we don't know where the end, what, you know, what the resuscitation point is for cryonics. It may be 50, maybe 20 years, it may be 50 years, it may be a thousand. God, I hope not. <laughs> and for other people, that's really exciting. And that's why they are cryonicists. They sign up because they want to see the future and they're really excited about it. So the very last thing I want to say is what to do with the cryonics. Um, is obviously we have to lessen those psychological barriers to choose cryonics um, by presenting cryonics as a form of medicine, not as freezing dead people. Um, encouraging community building. I do a whole lot of that in the Pacific Northwest through cryonics Northwest. Um, this is just a small portion of um, uh, cryonicists in 
the Pacific Northwest, and that does include British Columbia, which has an extremely large and active uh, life extension and cryonics community. Um, here we were just finishing up the standby and stabilization training because we do have uh, a kit out here supplied by Alcor um, with all of the components that we would need to carry out um, a standby and a stabilization for a local member. Um, facilitating legal instruments to retain financial assets during long-term care, that's another big psychological barrier for people because where's the money gonna be? They'd have, you know, of course you know there's gonna be some sort of rehabilitation and reintegration involved and you don't know really what that's gonna look like either. So if you could have some money that you could take with you that might lessen your, lessen your fears of that as well. And then assisting families in making cryonics decisions also. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. So having taken well we'll just start off with this as has somebody been pressured by it and then resuscitated? Been no. Resuscitated. Has a blood in it. Has a what? No, not so far. And that is one of, you know, you hear that a lot. Um, that kind of goes back to the uh, people don't think it'll work. And, and uh, you hear, we hear all, all the time that as soon as we bring back a small animal, then people will sign up in droves. The scientific tipping point will have been reached. And I'm not sure I believe that because we keep making these really, you know, they're these, I say increment, they are incremental steps. But um, some of some of the things that that have you know that we've we've uh, shown just in the last few years, like um, rewarming uh, brain slices and showing maintained coordinated electrical activity. I mean, that's just if you think about that, it, that's amazing. It's huge. Maybe, it's really maybe fantastic. Maybe and that has it. not translated into any increased growth whatsoever. None. Well, because it's not like a whole organism. I mean, I think... I know, and like I said, I hear the argument, guy, I just... It's like, I would totally, I totally sign a life insurance policy that had, uh, like, chronic preservation if I knew that within existing technical feasibility was, like... And I think there are going to be people. Well. Yeah, I think there really will be people that once that happens Absolutely. are like you, and they, they will do that. But will it translate into pretty much everybody wanting to? No, I'm not so sure about that myself. You know, uh, I'm just not certain. Uh, because it's not going to, you have to think about the fact that this, this hypothetical animal, um, and that's what we're trying to do in my lab, literally. We're, we're, first, we're, we're looking at, um, I, I also do brain, brain slice work, electrophysiology, so we're trying to replicate those exact same uh, LTP studies. Um, I just got um, whole brain um, electroencephalography equipment so that we can move to the next step. Uh, and try to get electrical activity and coordinated activity back from a whole brain. Uh, and then the next step is going to be the whole organism. You know, I mean, that's exactly where we're trying to go with it. But keep in mind, these are young, <coughs> healthy animals with no ischemia. They haven't undergone a long ag agonal period in pre-mortem pathologies and diseases and all of that stuff. So even if we can do that, it's still not going to benefit Humans. Yeah. I mean, to go At back least to not anytime soon. Yes. Um, to go back to examples yeah. on, yeah. on CPR, um, in CPR training, they'll, they'll, they'll say, you know, if you have a kid who's undergone cardiac arrest because of a traumatic incident, you have like an 80% chance of that being revived, not necessarily by you, but maybe through your efforts and later <laughs> on. But if someone has cardiac arrest and you start CPR on them, it's like a 3% chance of them actually being revived. Oh, because yeah, it's really low. If you're trying to restart a heart, it failed because right. it's a failing heart. Exactly. Yeah, right. and people don't think about that very often. You know, CPR, great. You're resuscitating someone who just, who what? Who just what? Who just happened to die right now for a reason because their heart was not in good condition. Right. Um, yeah, the the, chance, the the odds are not on your side, honestly. Um, you have to be prepared for, for failure in that circumstance. And I think it's the same, you know. Again, cryonics isn't any different from any other resuscitation technology as far as that's concerned. And in fact, it has a lot more going against it. Um, uh, because there are just so many other factors. So wouldn't you actually in some ways be closer to like recreational 
cryonics than uh, <laughs> medical cryonics. <laughs> Those of us who are just like extremely bored and have a lot of money, <laughs> like hang out for the end of the century, like. Uh, you know, I, 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 it, again, it depends on the, the, the pace of, of technological pro progress in, in other areas of medicine. It really does, and thank goodness, actually, that's that's going pretty well, and then, you know, even. We don't have mature medical nanotechnology um, at all, but uh, we definitely have people working towards that um, every day and making really significant progress uh, towards those things. I and mean, once you can manipulate matter on a molecular level, I mean, the whole world is in your hands, honestly. Do you ever, I'm not like, I don't really have feelings either way personally, but do you ever just contemplate on the concept of changing the way that uh, organisms, I mean humans, but just organisms in general operate and, you know, as far as like, you know, and I, I'm not saying that it's not different, like when something dies, it dies for a reason, there's a certain lifespan within a biosphere for a reason because, you know, this thing dies and then it's, it's got to die because it's got to move on and change and constantly, like germs are awesome at surviving because mm -hmm. they die and whatever. Mm -hmm. You ever contemplate that? I'm sure you do, but... Now we're talking Spider-Man theory. Yeah, <laughs> you, know what I mean? you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's just, that seems like to me is, is the scariest part is like what happens. I'm not even saying it's good or bad, but what happens to the human race once they, or not even the human race, but just once we start implementing that and kind of changing, we already have to a certain degree, I know, but this seems like a much bigger step to me, personally. Yeah, you know, and there's just reams that have been talked about and whole whole conferences <laughs> that yeah. have focused on these more, uh, these, these kinds of, um, I guess, theories about what will happen, what would happen under the circumstances. Um, largely, I don't concern myself with that stuff too much because there are lots of other people thinking about those things and yeah. I find that they all have to specialize. Yeah, <laughs> in that's order the legal system's job. <laughs> yeah, um, or economists or you know, whoever, you know, uh, philosophers. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's all sorts of gene therapies um, in progress right now that are allowing us to um, circumvent certain things before they even start. And that's fantastic. I think it's a really audacious goal, and it's going to help improve us overall. Um, and I think that's also why cryonics gets really, really easily associated with transhumanism, because we're overcoming a, a uh, human, not just human, but, you know, in this sense, a human limitation. Um, or we're trying to, at least. Uh, so for a lot of people, cryonics just seems like a natural extension of transhumanism. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, I think there's a, a, a lot that goes into that that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Um, and, again, it boils down to make some people uncomfortable and make some people really excited. So yeah. it's, it's really, it's a touchy subject for, for a lot of people. If I wanted to invest in a company, could I? Yeah. <laughs> You're going to so turn that down? Yeah. 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 No, like I'm in a public stock way or... Oh, or no, we are, we are extremely small. Um, okay. But, yeah, just get in touch with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will let you know, I, we have had a number of people who um, do want to invest uh, pub, you know, publicly that way. Yeah. So it's something that we're, we're, we're aiming towards letting people do in the near future. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. another social force that you have working against you is um, the view of this as a selfish act in a couple of different ways. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, if I'm not sure it's going to work, and I think, okay, if something happens to me and I know for sure that someone can benefit from having some of my organs, mm -hmm. then I would probably be more likely to do that and to say, well, maybe or maybe not this will work for me in the future. I think that, you know, as things get better and you can show better that it works, then that would mitigate that for certain iterations. I thought you were going in a whole nother direction with that. Oh, Thank you. Well, there's the, the other thing is once you get, okay, when it does work and once you get to the other end, then there's the whole population. 
Yes, okay, that's say, exactly where I thought you were going. You know, that. That's say, usually where the selfish argument yeah. is. <laughs> people say, no, it's time for you to die. Uh -huh. You know, you've had your turn. Right. And I'm not saying those are my views, but I think that is a very strong thing. For right, and again, there's there are whole conferences in which these are, you know, presentation, presentations, um, and people talk endlessly. I get really frustrated with it, honestly, because um, I don't think it's something we can really know until it happens. Mm -hmm. I tend to be a really experiential um, person in that sense. In a lot of ways, I don't like hypothesizing about certain things, yeah. but um, but as far as that goes, you know, I, like, like I said, lots and lots of has, has been said and argued. Um, I do think that it is, it would be such a fundamental change, obviously, that uh, we would have to fundamentally change in a number of other ways as well. But it would be such a huge fundamental change to be able to live indefinitely or, because uh, another thing that Cranach gets associated with is, is, is immortalism, um, which I also don't adhere to. Um, Cranach doesn't prevent you from dying, it, and it can't, you know. Um, you could, there's still existential risk, you could still be damaged in such a way that Cranach still can't help you. Um, uh, your brain can be destroyed to such an extent that no information can be inferred from this, this whatever structure may be left. Um, so, so you know, there's. I don't think immortalism is part and parcel with cryonics myself, but yes, <laughs> but I, I do I do really want to live as long as I want to live. I don't want nature to make that choice for me. Um, that said, I also want to be as healthy as possible um, for, for, for a nice long life. I don't wanna, you know, the, lots of people I used to give tours at Alcor and it, it just blew my mind that they wouldn't put that together. You have to make it really explicit that these people who are in, you know, who are preserved when they're resuscitated, they're like, but why would you wanna be resuscitated when you're old and, and frail? And so I'm like, um, yeah, that's not the goal. You know, yeah. that's not the goal at all. The goal is to be able to rejuvenate as well, um, but uh, yeah, there's, um, I think, a really, really overarching, I think you're right, um, view that cryonicists and anybody who wants to live longer than nature uh, has predefined for us is selfish. Which doesn't make sense, because that window has already... Has already increased, and nobody has had any problems with it, right? Right, right. <laughs> and I, I think the idea of saying that this is normal medical treatment would go a long way. Yeah, yeah, I do too. And I, I think we've, you know, past 10 years or so has seen a real change in how, uh, in how we talk about cryonics, how we present cryonics to others. Um, and it's almost like we spend so much time being so conscientious about the words you choose um, and the way that you talk to people that I'll meet a cryonist, an old, you know, really old cryonicist who has been participating since the 60s or 70s, and the words they use just go great. Oh yeah, we froze somebody, yeah, you know, that year, and and, uh, and then we, oh gosh, uh, suspension is a really common one because that was a really great sci-fi term that everybody loved to use, and and that's still, you know, technically more correct, um, et cetera. But, um, but yeah, we're trying to really make it a little more palatable and accessible to um, not only uh, the general population, but medical doctors and use the same terminology they use, the exact same, um, you know, you know, same procedures and uh, professionalized cramps too, because I think that had a lot to do with it as well. A lot of, and as it had to be, a lot of early cramps uh, uh, procedures um, and preservations were carried out in really suboptimal conditions um, with old used equipment that was scrounged from hospital dumpsters and things like that. Um, and that's just what you gotta do to get started, but now that it's established and there's a lot more, um, uh, a lot more members and, and funding because of that, um, it's allowed uh, organizations like Alcor um, and Cryonics Institute to really professionalize in a way that they haven't been able to before. Um, in particular, Alcor now utilizes a company in Florida called Suspended Animation. Um, 
they do all the standby and stabilizations for Alcor outside of the state of Arizona now. And uh, they have uh, contracted with medical uh, perfusionists um, on call throughout the United States. Now these guys pump cardiopulmonary bypass cases, um, you know, for the most part, uh, and they have to receive some uh, hands-on specific, hands-on training specific to cryonics because there are some, obviously there are some differences, but the base technology is the same. The equipment is the same. Um, the science behind it is, is, is the same. Um, so they're familiar with all these concepts. We use the same terminology and we use the same equipment and that really has, has helped our case a lot to the extent that we have uh, hospital cooperation in a lot of places. Um, so when there's a patient you know, who's about to die, instead of the cryonics organization being ostracized and told to get the hell out, um, the hospital staff and administrators work hand in hand with them to ensure that the patient's wishes are carried out. Um, and the stabilization can start on site even, uh, immediately after legal pronouncement, rather than, okay, here's legal pronouncement, now you have to put a tarp over the person and wheel them through Timbuktu, way away from everybody else, you know, and it takes 10 minutes for you to even get that person um, into a place where you can start procedures. So we've really seen, we've seen a lot of, um, a lot of changes there in recent history as well. Um, there was a lot of talk several years ago about some mice that were suspended in low hydrogen sulfide. Low metabolism and hydrogen sulfide, yeah. yeah. And I was wondering uh, if that research has continued, if you know more about the current state of hydrogen sulfide. Uh, I will briefly answer that by saying that there is an entire article on our blog about it. Okay. Um, so and it, it very briefly, in general, those results don't translate to larger organisms. Right. Probably mm -hmm. having to do with the fact that energy metabolism in small organisms versus larger organisms is very different. Uh, the question I have is, um, are any, is there any like biomimicry going on for the antifreeze compounds, like for people investigating frog antifreezes or the ones that uh, are used by like Parker Crown Schools? Yeah, there's a, whole, uh, there's a, there's, you know, uh, actually cryobiologists um, who are interested in, in vitrification solutions, which basically is a uh, Brian Wilk and Greg Fay at 21st Century Medicine. Um, they spend a lot, a lot of time. Brian Wilk's a biophysicist, and uh, Greg's a cryobiologist, and together they make an amazing team. And uh, you know, if you have someone like a biophysicist on your team um, looking at cryoprotectants, that person can know things like, well, if we take this uh, hydroxyl group and remove it and do, you know, substitute it with this, then we'll see an increase in viscosity of X percent under these conditions and, and, and it allows him to model and extrapolate a lot of things um, uh, and to try a lot of new things. And he does base a lot of that based, uh, based on research um, uh, on those kinds of organisms that, yeah, we're, we're fascinated, absolutely fascinated by uh, mammals in particular, uh, but any kind of organism that already has a successful method of, of cryopreservation going on as a means of um, uh, extending its life or hibernating or whatever. Do you have any hibernating Extreme counts? harsh, uh, I mean, uh, surviving harsh conditions, you name it. Do you have any hibernating pets? I'm sorry? Do you have any pets that hibernate? Do I have any pets that hibernate? Personally? Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> I have two dogs. <laughs> and they sometimes wish they could hibernate, I'm sure. They don't. Um, does your patient trust that you're talking about? Does it include like a um, educational and like social cultural reintegration once resuscitation? So that's the general idea. They, I don't think it's very well um, defined so mm -hmm. far because, for the most part, uh, cryonics has been really focused on uh, what it can do now to preserve mm -hmm. people. Um, but definitely, that is the, the kind of general idea behind the patient care trust. Rehabilitation, reintegration, education, job skills, mm -hmm. um, all of that. Whatever it takes to make you a happy, healthy, functioning human being in future society. Maybe therapy. Quite possibly <laughs> therapy. <laughs> <laughs> and Alcor actually just introduced a model um, revoca revocable uh, uh, trust that can be used by individual um, members 
to uh, to keep their personal funds in perpetuity while they're they're preserved as well. Something that you can you take the model and you can take it to your uh, attorney or estate planner or whatever and you know, change it to suit your particular circumstances. But um, it's based on a number uh, of, of of trusts that have been set up by wealthy prionicists over the years. Um, well, we found that a, a number of other people were obviously wondering the same thing. Well, mm -hmm. can I can I take my funds with me, my assets with me, right. um, so that I have them available? Because um, a lot of people are, are, of course, thinking at the rate of, of uh, at the pace of you know rate of current technological advances, um, we could be seeing mature nanotechnology and rejuvenation and uh, re resuscitation from cryonics all within the next. 40 or 50 years or so, that's really not very far away. And I kind of want your things. <laughs> I'm going to have my pets with me, so. <laughs> and my husband. <laughs> All right, well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, let's give uh, another round of applause. <laughs> um, next, uh, the next one is November 27th. We have Dee Williams of Portland Alternative Dwellings. Uh, her talk is called Going Big by Living Small. Microhouses, structures that are often smaller than 200 square feet have captured the attention of mainstream media and the hearts of thousands of Americans. Tiny house advocates explain that these small, simple structures provide a flexible, affordable, reasonable, albeit small, solution for residential use, urban infill, and pocket communities. Dee will offer her experience designing and building microhouses with a focus on the unique benefits and challenges of taking small to the extreme. Dee is a designer, builder, and certified tiny house net. She teaches workshops across the country with a focus on green building and micro housing. She's also authored a how-to ebook, Go House Go, and has consulted with hundreds of people to design and build their own micro homes. She's been featured in Yes Magazine, Time Magazine on Good Morning America, New York Times, National Public Radio, PBS, and other media. In 2008, Dee won the Washington State Governor's Award for Sustainable Practices. Dee's house is currently featured in a five-year exhibit, House and Home, at the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C. Should be great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I love all the questions, too. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, we're That's in kind of Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Totally. So, in um, December, four weeks from today, we do um, the alumni party, which is basically invites everybody that's come to speak to hang out and oh, we just like talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> totally. And it's, I mean, it's, um, four weeks from today, I think it's December 13th. Oh, okay. okay. Correct. I could be wrong, but. Yeah, thanks so much for coming. Yeah, you got to. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, it was definitely not so